Aloha. Good morning, everybody. My name is Rob Hack from the Hawaii Pacific Export Council. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Hawaii Pacific Export Council, I put up our website here at hawaiiexportsupport.com and a calendar of our events is here on the left. We are a 501c3 nonprofit, um, what is called a DEC or a District Export Council. There are as many as I believe now 61 DECs throughout the United States that are um, our sister organizations. And we are offshoots of the US Department of Commerce and that all of our board members are vetted and approved by the Secretary of Commerce and um, our chair Currently is Frank Haas, he's on, and uh, Vice Chair is Dale Wright, he's on. I'm also on the board and I act as our program manager and coordinator. We have a grant, uh, a generous grant from the Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism here in Hawaii called DBET, who in turn gets their grant from SBA as part of a STEP grants or state trade expansion program that's rebranded here in Hawaii as High Step. And we put on, uh, uh, as part of High Step, a series of webinars and perform one on one company mentoring sessions as part of that grant. This program today is not part of that grant. This is um, uh, Hawaii Pacific Export Council programming that augments the high step program and we're very happy to be able to put this on today and we appreciate the generous time of our speakers today alicia taylor is a senior advisor from the u.s department of commerce industrial trade administration section on service industries so we'll get a very big picture from her in washington dc Locally here in Honolulu, we have Robert Zhang from uh, WATG Architecture and Herman Kugler from Makai Ocean Engineering. Uh, with that, I'd like to uh, just make sure that everybody understands we are recording this video and we will put it up on our YouTube channel in about a week after some minor editing. And here on our YouTube channel is an archive of the 75-ish videos that we've recorded over the years on various export-related topics. Um, and I encourage you to uh, check out our archive when you have a chance. Um, the topic of services exports is a fascinating one because it's one that's very important to Hawaii and it's one that is growing uh, incredibly for the state of Hawaii and also for other parts of the United States. So we're excited to be able to put together this program for you today on exporting of services. Our first speaker, as I alluded to earlier, is Alicia Taylor. Uh, she's a, a senior advisor for the International Trade Administration. Um, this section assesses the global competitive environment for services sectors, addresses foreign market trade and investment barriers and promotes services export opportunity to support American jobs. The organization includes Office of Finance and Insurance Industries, Office of Supply Chain, Professional and Business Services, and the Offices of Digital Service Industries. So Alicia, I would ask you to please begin. I will um, share your presentation if you bear with me for a second. And uh, you will tell me when to advance the slide. Sounds good. Thank you very much, Rob. Can you hear me okay? Very clearly. Wonderful. Uh, and I want to thank the Hawaii Pacific Export Council for inviting me to talk to you today about exporting services. Um, you're getting a little ahead of me there on the slides right now. I'm on slide one. Thank you. Um, I wish I could have traveled to Hawaii to be there with you in person today. Um, DC's got pretty gray skies and rainy. And if I had been able to travel, I might have been able to satisfy my several year craving for the white pineapple I once had on the island of Kauai. It's amazing stuff. I tried to get them to ship it to me anyway. It didn't quite work out. Anyway, as we all know, the last year has been exceptionally challenging for services industries like tourism. Um, 
But with the increasing number of Americans being vaccinated and global population actually being vaccinated, there's hope that soon travel and the other services will be able to rebound. I wanna to start today by defining some terms because after 20 years in government, I no longer trust my radar to differentiate government jargon from real world conversations. So I ask you to bear with me a little bit. Um, starting at the basics, what do I mean when I talk about services? The short answer is almost anything that isn't grown, fished or manufactured. There's a long list here on slide two, um, got movies and entertainment, restaurants, travel and tourism, um, the parts of our supply chain, shipping, rail, trucking, air cargo, architecture, engineering, design, and construction. I don't think I remember to include laying undersea cables, but that's also a service. Um, finance, legal, consulting. Anyway, you can see the list. I'm not going to go through all of it. Um, but let's talk about what services trade means and exporting services. When something's tangible, like a ukulele or that pineapple, um, determining when it's an export is pretty straightforward. Does the good physically cross the border to another country? The definition doesn't work with services. You could actually consume a services export from another country without ever leaving your own home. Um, so, but that's only one of the ways that a service can be exported. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about modes of supply and that's in the trade world, how we differentiate types of service, how you receive a service and export a service. But quick aside, um, a decent amount of our international trade is protected by agreements negotiated under the World Trade Organization or our free trade agreements, FTAs, you may hear me call them. Very simply, these agreements are just contracts be between governments that usually address how governments will treat companies or products from each other's countries. I'll tell you more about it later on, but I mention it now because it's a WTO agreement called the General Agreement on Trade and Services that categorizes how services are supplied and where they're supplied in order for them to be an export. There's four categories that are active, in active use right now. One is called cross-border services. That's when, and sorry, this would be slide, the next slide, please. Um, I've put them up here because it's a little bit complicated and I will use some of these terms as we move through the presentation. Um, so cross-border services refer to when a service moves from, when a service provider moves from one country to another, sorry, when the service moves from one country to another, usually by mail or over the internet. So when a U.S. architect in the United States says, pl sends plans for a house to someone in Singapore, that's a services export. Uh, when someone in New Zealand streams the latest Marvel movie through Disney Plus, that's an American services export. Both of those were actually American services. Consumption abroad is the next category. And that's when the foreigner uses a service in another country while in that country. So you're as an American, you travel to Japan on ANA, you stay in a Japanese hotel, you've added to Japan's export of services. When a Japanese tourist comes to the United States on Hawaiian Airlines, stays in the Marriott, they're adding to the United States export of services. It's a little confusing. Now we're gonna add commercial presence. And this is when a company from one country sets up a physical branch or storefront or something like that in another country. So Walmart opened something called Flipkart Wholesale in India. That's also a service export as provided by a commercial presence. The last category is movement of natural people, natural persons. So this involves a national going from one country to another country to provide the service. Uh, maybe a doctor going from St. Francis Hospital to cure a body to perform surgery. Um, all right, so now that we know what we mean by services, let's talk about the statistics. Next slide, please. I'm not gonna give you a whole ton of numbers. Um, they change every day. The latest numbers we have are 2018 and uh, services numbers are tough. But I did wanna provide you with some examples of how services are grouped for our statistical purposes. And this is 
some, I've taken some notes here on the Bureau of Economic Analysis groupings of services. So when we talk about transport, that's including sea, air, coastal, roads. Um, when we talk about biz, uh, travel, that's the business, health-related, education-related. Um, construction is kind of broken out, but architecture services and engineering services are incorporated in other business services. Um, and then you've got some strange breakouts here for charges for use of intellectual property. So if you've got AV product that you're giving a license for reproduction or distribution, that goes into the charges for the use of intellectual property. But if you're just getting a use license, that's the personal, cultural, and recreational services. So it's all over the place. Here's a little bit of a roadmap for you to go by. But Believe it or not, pre-pandemic, about two-thirds of U.S. GDP came from services, and over 80% of U.S. employees work in the service sector. The last number I found uh, for Hawaii indicated that you guys only had 79% of your employees working in service sectors. You're pretty close to the national average, but I kind of wonder what happened with that last 1% there. Um, Anyway, officially our services account for about one third of US exports. But again, because the numbers, it, services are so hard to track across borders, um, the official statistics tend to undercount services related trade. Um, that said, as of 2018, the United States was the world's largest services exporter, exporting over $827 billion across borders and over 1.5 trillion in sales through foreign affiliates. That's that commercial presence I mentioned. Hawaii contributed about $4.3 billion in cross-border services exports, which supported about 33,000 jobs. Continuing with the 2018 values, the top destinations for Americans to sell services across the borders were the European Union, United Kingdom, Canada, China, Japan, and Ireland. The top industries tended to be travel, financial, other business services, which as we saw was a lot of things. Um, and then for Hawaii, your biggest services exports were travel transport and other business services as well. Um, and those were primarily going to the European Union, China, Canada, and Japan. Now, if we break it down by sectors though, the top, set, the top destinations are gonna adjust. For example, Japan, UK, Bermuda, Canada, and Australia were our top markets for insurance services, while Canada and Ireland replaced Bermuda and Australia in the top markets for financial services. The top destinations for US information and communication services include Canada, the UK, Japan, Germany, and Switzerland, but we did our best recruiting for international students from China, India, South Korea, Canada, and Saudi Arabia. So I'm not gonna keep talking services statistics, it's a lot, but that's the macro picture of services trade. Let's talk at the company level. So many small companies start exporting through personal relationships that they have with the people they trust in other countries. And that works, and that's a great starting point if you have those relationships. But whether you do or not, all companies can benefit from looking to their local USAC, the US Export Assistance Center representative for assistance. In Hawaii, you have one of the most experienced in John Holman. He can connect you with our international resources at the Department of Commerce to find and vet potential buyers or partners in other countries. And I believe you have a couple of people on the board here who also have experience doing this and can give you some suggestions. Um, but if we're talking about other countries, I'd like to suggest looking at countries where the United States has a comprehensive free trade agreement. That's slide five, please. You might ask why I like the FTAs. Well, in the FTAs, the US has negotiated for US companies to be able to sell their services to citizens of other countries on essentially a level playing field. That means that those countries have promised to treat most US services exporters and their exports as if they were from that individual country. So if you're a services exporter from the United States exporting your services to Australia, they're gonna treat you like an Australian in most instances. 
Um, they usually have also agreed to allow you to supply a service without having a legal presence in that country. So that can help save money by not having to have a place where they can come serve you for due process and things like that. In some of our free trade agreements, digital trade barriers that impact countries, companies across all sectors while doing business overseas are prohibited. Examples of some of those barriers you might otherwise find would be limitations on what data can flow across borders, particularly like PII, requirements that data be stored in that foreign country, and treating digital products such as software, apps, eBooks, and music differently just become the, because they come from a different country. So the FTA helps deal with all of that. I'll also mention a couple of more things about our FTAs. If you office a serve, offer a service through a commercial presence, like a branch, um, there's a good chance that the FTA guarantees that you can transfer the profits back to the United States, regardless of what their transfer rules might otherwise be. Next slide, please. In election, sorry, these are some of our FTA um, treatment of services. So I'll go to next slide, please. The intellectual property rights are also critically important to many businesses and particularly for a service pr provider, your copyright, your design, something like that, that may be a heart and soul of your business. This, these are examples of what I mean when I talk about intellectual property rights. And our FT, in our FTAs, our partners have promised to recognize and protect intellectual property rights. You may still have to register your right in country in order for it to be protected, but this guarantees that you can and that there should be legal options available if you absolutely have to go down that path. ITA has a stopfakes.gov website, which is an incredible resource for information about protecting your intellectual property right in other countries, even those we don't have an FTA with. Next slide, please. ITA's primary website is trade.gov, which has a ton of information about exporting and country-specific research that Hi. can even provide, yep, sorry, okay, uh, can provide research that on and guidance on which sectors in a country might be ripe for exports. For example, did you know that Cybersecurity is a top concern of the Canadian government and their National Security Action Plan provided roughly 450 million in funding for cybersecurity improvements. That's the kind of information in, which I actually got last night from browsing our information and communications technology or ICT opportunities in the Country Commercial Guide for Canada. And these guides are updated annually. So we always have good information there. I'm also particularly fond of ITA's video channel, which includes advice on exporting to particular countries and an exporting basics playlist with men, most of the videos only a few minutes long. So you get a quick bit of information that can help you make decisions or at least give you places to go to ask the next question. I'll give you one caveat though, as your services industries, um, much of the content on our YouTube channel is aimed more towards goods as opposed to services. So it may be more efficient for you to just have that conversation with your, with John, um, the UZAC representative. But if you are browsing around on there, you might want to look at some of our success stories. Um, there's services companies like SRI International, which is an R&D company, the New York Film Academy, and my personal favorite, just because it's a fun video, uh, Johnny Rockets restaurant, where they tell you how they were able to really expand using the services of our commercial service and our um, UZX. So one of the other things we do is to administer mechanisms that will allow you to legally transfer personal data from your clients to the United States so you can act on it. In some countries, if you do this incorrectly, you can face pretty significant fines. All right. That's a lot of information, but let's talk money because, you know, it's money. Often states would have resources and we've talked a little bit about them. These re resources that are underwritten by the Small Business Administration, they can help offset the costs of starting or expanding exporting, like participating in international trade shows 
or using the commercial gold key service. Um, I guess it's debit uh, in Hawaii. It gets these funds and that's part of the high step program, which I saw was on the website at the beginning of the presentation. So they can tell you about them. It's great programs. There's lots of things they, that you can use that money for to help you expand your exporting. Then when your company gets that deal, SBA and the US XM Bank, Export Import Bank, also known as XM, might be able to offer some useful services like working capital to help you fulfill that export order, financing to allow your company to offer credit to a foreign customer, or insurance that could protect your company if a foreign buyer doesn't pay. So the great places, and again, John Holman will be able to help you navigate through a lot of this stuff. Um, if you're talking at a bigger level, ITA also has contacts at multilateral, multinational development banks who can help with financing for large infrastructure projects, which typically include significant amounts of services such as engineering, design, and process licenses. In some countries, we can even connect you with the foreign prime contractors who will bid on their country's big infrastructure projects or advocate for your company's on your company's behalf with a foreign government if you bid directly on a foreign government procurement. If by chance you're interested in contributing to policy development, ITA offers a number of trade advisory committee options where you can offer your views and perspectives. And lastly, on the off chance that an international transaction doesn't go entirely as planned or you can't sell into a country because of some market barrier, we have resources that can help with that too. So I've covered just a few of the services that the US government provides to US companies who are engaged or wanna be engaged in international, in international trade. And John can help connect you with the right people as you walk down this path. And when you do talk to him, make sure he tells you about his, how he helped the Leeward Community College expand their international student recruitment. Thank you. Great, Alicia, thank you very much. Um, we have a few questions, but I'd like to wait until the end uh, so we can ask the questions to all the panelists. Um, bear with me one second here. Our next speaker is uh, Robert Zhang. He's the Executive Vice President and Senior Director of Development of Asia Pacific for WATG Architecture. Perhaps more importantly, he's also a board member of the Hawaii Pacific Export Council. And we, I thank him very much for his service in that regard. Um, he has directly impacted WATG's expanding portfolio of projects in the Asia Pacific region with project experience in China, Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia, Japan, Australia, India, and others. He has analyzed research data to support WATG's strategic direction into international expansion. I know his background image today is Bora Bora, so maybe he can explain a little bit about how he got that background. Um, Robert, you have to unmute yourself and you're free to begin whenever you can. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, I'm ready. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, thank you for giving me the opportunity. Uh, I'm going to share, it's been a kind of historical perspective to see how we get into the exporting services of a design. And then the end of uh, that story, I'm going to draw a few points that we may, um, we are still using, we still apply to our daily life that may shed some light on the firms, for those firms who are interested or willing to uh, maybe do also exporting the services. WADG is a firm uh, founded in 1945. Uh, we used to be, well, the full name is Wimberley Allison Town and Gu. And so this gentleman, um, hold on, let me see the slides. This gentleman, Pete Wimber, um, he was very visionary, uh, was serving the army and his car um, racer, uh, is really passionate about it. And then um, he formed a kind of workshop <clears throat> of architecture design, two main workshop. 
And then the first project they did is uh, the Royal Hawaiian Hotel in, in Waikiki and then developed the interest in the hotel design. And then um, did a few um, really remarkable projects in Hawaii. Uh, this is a Waikiki Inn, it's, it's no longer in existence. Uh, it's the site, I think well today's uh, Hilton's Grand Waikiki Inn. I think that's probably how they got that name. Uh, that's the lobby of the hotel back in the 50s. You can see the forward thinking of architecture, the sheer uh, roof shape is really make a strong statement back in those days. But of course in Hawaii, you can't just do hotels or hospitality related projects. It's just, it was such a small project. So we were very humble and um, really looking for any type of buildings. This is the office building still in Waikiki is the Bank of Hawaii building. Uh, it's very contemporary, uh, the facade. Um, besides the aesthetic features also have some functional feature of it, uh, make it very contemporary. Also play some, uh, create some shades to play, to really block the sun, uh, sunlight from outside. Uh, it's, it's, I would say it's very unique building still today in Waikiki. So he was looking around, if I want to do more hotels, I need to go beyond Hawaii territories, looking at the map where to go. Um, then you see the South Pacific, probably a bit closer, slightly closer I think, than, than California, if you look at Tahiti. Um, so he was saying, how can I get there? He, he needs, he, he was putting some thinking of the airline industry. If they put a route to some well destination, definitely they need a hotel because once you send people there, they need a place to stay. So he contacted the Pan Am back then, I think it was probably major carriers in the States to check whether they have any interests in putting some routes uh, to the Pacific. It's very, very timely question. Uh, they, Pan Am was also interested in expanding to the South Pacific in Tahiti in this case. So, and then they were doing a scouting trips over there. So he joined them uh, to just to find out what the, it looked like in the Pacific. And then um, eventually got our first project uh, in uh, Tahiti. This is the Hotel Bora Bora. That's my background actually, uh, Rob was talking about. Uh, this became a first above the water villas. Uh, the inspiration really coming from the uh, site of visit to see the fishing village on the island and then use that as a, an inspiration to lay out a hotel, bring the fishing village lifestyle into the resort experiences. It became a hit right away. And then through that South Pacific success, then we moved to New Zealand, Australia, and eventually land into Asia, uh, Asia Pacific. Uh, that's the first project completed in Asia, that's in Singapore, that's the Shangri-La, it's back in the 70s. And then through that, and we continue to expand Asia, uh, even till today, uh, we have been working in over 170 countries and territories, I would say. Um, once you get into it, you definitely will be exposed to more opportunities. Uh, like how we got from Australia and New Zealand to uh, Asia. It's really the connections, business connections between uh, Singapore and Australia back in those days brought us into this opportunity. I uh, met the owner of the Shangri-La Group, um, Robert Quart. And then we continue to, um, I would not say conquer, to, to really get into more countries and territories. And this is uh, really the strong desire to know the local lifestyle, uh, appreciate their culture, uh, you enjoy their food, you know, you, you need to have that kind of mentality in, to go into international because it's, it's gonna be different. It's gonna be sometimes poses some challenges uh, in terms of how you communicate, how you do business. Um, this is the latest project. I just used that as an example, India Goa. It's really the lifestyle that the living courts in their residences locally in Goa really excites us to see the living quarters. You can see on, on the right side, that's the living spaces. So if you, uh, the left side, if you can see the right side, it's really like a 
front gate of the living quarters, but separated by a kind of little lily ponds. Um, we kind of really like that kind of sequence. So when we design the hotel guest rooms for the Four Seasons, we use the same similar principle from the visits to the local uh, residences with the local people. We dined with them, they showed us around uh, their uh, living spaces in the sequence, and they showed everything very generous, um, very embracing and inviting. And this is an urban setting uh, at another, having to be another Four Seasons project in, in China. Um, but bring the Four Seasons experiences in this kind of hustling uh, place in downtown of uh, one of the mega cities in China. How can you really present a create a really tranquil uh, experiences uh, for a Four Seasons guest? So we moved the entrance to the upper level a bit of stay away from the hustling and uh, rustling um, activities down uh, on the ground level from the, because that's a heavy shopping district. It creates a, a oasis in this kind of um, really busy district, uh, really presents a persistence experiences from the beginning, from the entering the hotel. Um, so really kind of really, you look at your guests' needs, you really put yourself into their, sh their shoes to um, really transform them in the locale that they are visiting from the Goa experiences to this um, uh, urban setting experiences in China. Um, those are the, just a, a quick snapshot um, of what we have gone through. Uh, I would say a few questions I would ask when you consider exporting. The first question you should ask yourself is why uh, are you interested and why do you um, look at the export. In our cases, I think there's two reasons behind that. It's really want to expand our business beyond the uh, Hawaii territory. If we want to continue on specialize uh, in the hotel and the hospitality industry. Uh, so you have to go uh, horizontally. Uh, another factor behind that is our early funders. Even today's um, uh, the employees of uh, this generation we really have a, a strong desire to appreciate the foreign cultures and meet the people from different places and, and so on. So those, I would say kind of, I would say the drivers behind that, we want to go international, uh, bring the Hawaiian experiences and to benefit international community and also learn um, the experience, really the experiences we have from outside to bring that back into Hawaii to really make our products uh, accommodations and guest experiences to a, a more higher level and to an international level. And then uh, the second question I would ask is really what is your value proposition? You know, what are you good at? Um, in our case, it's really are you, we use the Hawaiian success to basically in early stage to export the success into the international um, markets to help them also uplift uh, they are hotel uh, inventories and, and accommodations. Uh, the third question is really how do you really market your service to those places foreign unheard of? Um, I would say to use a lot of uh, third parties and collaborators and then look at your food chain, uh, who are the major collaborators you have been working with and then um, ask them and work with them. In our case, in the first international project, it's really working with Pan Am in that sense. Uh, really help us to kind of uh, uh, get into the international markets. By the way, through so that uh, collaboration and relationships, uh, they actually form PADA. I think now it's probably the biggest, um, largest international uh, tourism organization uh, today. Um, and then um, another question is really, I said, bring the Hawaii experiences, the, the uh, Ohana, the family um, sense and the approach when we take on any projects, uh, you treat every stakeholders and collaborators, clients, finances, and local governments. I think you treat them all like as a family working towards the same goal, i.e. to really bring the dream into reality of a um, destination or a development uh, that benefits uh, every uh, stakeholders in it. So it's not just uh, for ourselves, it's really for the whole uh, Ohana family. So I, that kind of culture elements from Hawaii really benefits us 
to formulate the, our philosophy and the business approach. You know, I also would say the Aloha spirit is also great plus. Uh, just be always positive and uh, appreciative. I said that when you go to international or foreign land, a strange land, exotic places, you just have always to be expect some unexpected, um, not a, being afraid of that. I would say it's more kind of embrace it, uh, appreciate it, and then uh, you will you will feel fulfilled actually once you kind of get into it and start to appreciate. Uh, for example, the food is always sometimes can be a challenge when you go to exotic places. If you try to avoid it, uh, evasive of it, uh, you just kind of, I want to try it. I, I really uh, want to make a try. I really want to appreciate how you live, how you uh, eat on a daily basis, um, uh, Mr. Mister So and So from that locale. And then start to share your, your stories and listen to their stories and build that relationship and then demonstrate your, really, um, uh, your appreciation. And the last thing I just want to touch a bit is really get a paid because uh, we're running a business and just make sure that you, you, will, be, you will be paid. Uh, there will be some challenges, but it can be overcome. Just be, the, um, be diligent on that payment issue. And you can actually get a very, fairly good pay um, records we compared our kind of bad debt ratio, uh, that was a few years back. Our bad debt ratio, I was using the China experience, actually is not, not higher than that in the States. We're actually sometimes even lower than the bad debt ratio in the States. So everybody's talking about how hard to get them paid uh, in the foreign countries, in this case in China. But if you are diligent enough and then really look at, into some nuances, um, you can do quite uh, very well actually. So those are the few points I have, and I'm more uh, ready and excited to see if you have any questions uh, later on. Thank you, Rob. And Thank you very you. much, Robert. That was an excellent presentation. Uh, we do have some questions for you, but we'll wait until the very end uh, and ask everybody. So thank you again. Sure. Our next speaker is Herman Kugler. He's the business development manager for Mackay Ocean Engineering an innovative ocean technology and engineering firm providing engineering products and services worldwide since 1973. Mackay's staff includes physicists, oceanographers, and engineers. Herman leads the company's efforts in commercial and federal projects across the company's area of expertise and services both domestically and internationally. So Herman, please, uh, unmute yourself and share your screen, if you will, and proceed with your presentation. Sure. Where is your background, Herman? Uh, that's our offices. Um, we're lucky enough to be on the water. <laughs> is, is that, that's Waimanalo? Yeah. Great. It gets a little scary when there's, you know, big wave, waves or hurricanes coming in, but, you know, a beautiful day, there's nothing like it. <laughs> All right, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, as Rob said, my name is uh, Herman Kugler. I'm Mackay's Business Development Manager. Uh, and today I'm gonna be giving you a bit of background into uh, the type of work that we do uh, and some of the uh, services that we've been able to export and how we've done that. Uh, so this slide shows kind of the, th the three pillars of Mackay, as we like to say. Um, these are kind of the three main areas of business that we work within. Um, the first, which is uh, probably what we're most well known for, um, and which is our largest export market, is uh, subsea cable software. Uh, so we have the world's number one software for planning and uh, installing subsea telecommunications cables. Um, you know, a lot of people don't realize that even in current day, we still have cables running across the ocean uh, to provide our internet. Um, and our software is used to both plan those, you know, build out the design, and then actually used on the vessels to uh, control the cable installation. Uh, so that's been used uh, to install over 600,000 kilometers worldwide of cable. Uh, the second tier uh, is our 
DOD Science and Technology and uh, Broad Ocean Engineering Group. Uh, this is where we're providing a lot of research and development type work. Um, not much of this is uh, internationally commercialized. Um, this is more uh, domestic um, projects that we're working on for largely the Navy, um, but we have some other customers, including Department of Energy, uh, where we develop, you know, innovative uh, technology solutions like uh, underwater vehicles um, and then, you know, unique subsea cable networks and sensors. Uh, and then the final uh, area, which is another one of our most popular and uh, probably the largest uh, international service commercialization success that we've had. Um, you know, the subsea cable software that I described first is more of a product. We do provide some services. Uh, we do provide, you know, on vessel support services, but that's more of most of the revenues that we've received from that are from direct sales of a, of a good or our software. Um, but the ocean engineering or energy group uh, is uh, where we've been able to commercialize internationally our services, our engineering services, uh, where we've, you know, we've kind of positioned ourselves to become a pioneer in a couple of technologies, including seawater air conditioning and ocean thermal energy conversion, um, which both use deep seawater to um, uh, as a renewable energy resource. Uh, but another aspect of that group is uh, installing those pipelines uh, and designing those pipelines. So that's the real tricky part that um, that we work on and what sets us apart. Um, you know, it's it's a very long pipeline that's worth several million dollars. You know, in the tens of million dollars typically, uh, and they want it to be designed properly. And if if you don't uh, design it properly and you don't know the methods of installation. Uh, which we which we do know how to do, uh, they could lose that asset. You know, they could damage the pipeline during installation. So that's that's one of the big uh, services that we've exported, and we've been able to do that because of our, you know, informing the clients, telling them the issues that can arise, and then we we inform them of what we do instead. You know, to mitigate those problems, uh, and then just to brief background before I move on from this slide. Uh, we have 37 employees, so we're, we're still a very small company, um, but we are still able to, you know, stand out in, in these international markets uh, due to our, you know, expertise. So here's a little bit more information on, uh, as I mentioned, our, our biggest commercial success. Uh, both internationally and you know domestically is our is our cable software. Uh, we've received over thirty five million dollars in revenues uh, from this product and our services. Uh, and um, you know we've actually positioned ourselves. We developed the software early before the you know dot com boom. Uh, so we started you know developing the software in nineteen eighty three. Uh, and we were able to, you know, get into that market before, you know, everyone started installing these cables uh, to to support the, uh, you know, the internet revolution that we're, you know, experiencing today. Uh, so we are currently the world's number one software for doing that, uh, and we're used by over 80% of the global cable uh, ship installation fleet. Uh, so. Uh, you know we've we've experienced you know good success in uh, with this product and through through the years to stay relevant we also need to keep improving you know we we provide uh, services such as um, you know supporting on vessel support that's something that wasn't even a a uh, part of the you know initial development but that was part of you know us trying to to change with the times uh, and I think that's very important with staying relevant in international markets is you know update your products constantly update your services update what you offer make your clients happy that's the big thing um, you know along those lines as well we've developed other modules for our software where we've you know it was initially developed for only telecom cables um, but with you know the the new uh, kind of growing offshore renewable energy market, 
there's a need now for you know offshore power cables. So we've developed a, a module for our software that you know the cable itself is very different than a than a telecommunications cable. Um, but uh, so we've actually included that in a, in a new module for our customers so that they can stay ahead of their market as well. You know, they're, they're already using our software. They can, you know, jump into this, this power cable installation project, uh, even if that's not their typical background because they have the tools, they have our software. Uh, and then oil and gas also uses our software. Um, they, they lay subsea arrays basically for seismic, um, trying to find, you know, seismic modeling. Uh, and our software is used uh, for that industry to kind of model those as well. Uh, so our ocean energy uh, department, again, like I said, this is probably our largest service market. Uh, and there's kind of three areas within this. Um, as I mentioned, there's seawater air conditioning, uh, which uses deep seawater to, to cool buildings. Um, and then uh, on the far right, there's ocean thermal energy conversion, which uses the temperature differential between uh, deep cold seawater and the warm surface seawater to generate electricity. Um, and then right in the middle of those two, which is the enabling technology, is the pipeline. Um, and that's, that's the key service that we've exported uh, internationally for basically our, our entire existence. That's what started our company in the 1970s. And um, we've been you know, staying in that market as well. Um, and it's not just these two technologies, it's not just seawater air conditioning and OTEC, but we install pipelines for you know, traditional power plant cooling or you know, manufacturing facility uh, intake or outfall pipelines, uh, anything in that sort of area. And the big takeaway here is you know, Mackay and thus Hawaii really lead the world in these technologies. Um, you know, even though people don't think of Hawaii as someone that you know would would lead these markets, we do um, because we've we've stayed you know relevant. Uh, so brief, I'll go through this real quick. Seawater air conditioning. This just gives you an idea of you know the technology and how it's used. Uh, I won't go into the details, but it's a very um, simple components, um, but it's just the, the nuances of installing them. Like I said, the pipelines are a, a large uh, asset for these types of projects. So uh, we design those properly to, uh, to you know, protect their investment. Uh, and this is the largest, uh, this is kind of a, a summary of our pipeline services or pipeline design services, as I said, is our largest uh, international uh, service commercialization success. Uh, and these are the services that we provide. So, you know, as I mentioned, we do the, the design itself of the pipelines. Um, we've started, you know, designing uh, the intakes themselves. Uh, you know, there's, there's regulations on how much water you can pull in. Um, and basically the intake design uh, can, and uh, mitigate that those issues. Uh, we also do, you know, we have tools such as like modeling, um, both the hydrodynamic modeling as shown in the top right uh, and CSD in the bottom right. But we also do, um, you know, we do this dispersion modeling as shown in the bottom left of this slide, where we actually analyze the uh, the water that's being or the water or other product being you know put out into the water into the ocean or into a lake or something like that um, such as uh, water treatment uh, outfall uh, pipelines so we we don't just do the design but we we cover all the services again to meet our clients needs um, you know they come to us and they they say they have you know an issue or they don't have a solution we adapt and we we develop something to cover that so I think that's that's critical. Uh, if you are, you know, going to be commercializing something, it's just listen to your clients. You know, always, you know, be willing to adapt. Don't just say no. We don't have that ability. Um, you know, be willing to to adjust your services or or products accordingly. Uh, again, ocean thermal energy conversion. 
here. Uh, as I described the technology, it's, it's basically using the temperature differential to generate electricity. Uh, we've been involved in this industry as well since the 1970s, again, because of that uh, deep seawater pipeline that's required. We have the experience to design those. Uh, so it's kind of, it's a natural fit for us. Um, and we, we currently have the world's largest and first grid connected uh, OTEC facility uh, as shown in the right there, uh, that's in, in Kona. Um, and that was uh, turned on in 2015, uh, which that was a big, you know, international uh, achievement for Makai uh, and Hawaii, um, you know, having this facility, you know, up and running. It's the first one in the world that's technically the largest, still a small, you know, OTEC plant, but um, it's, it's a step uh, towards, you know, the, the eventual commercialization of, of these power plants. Um, the big takeaway here is we've, we've been able to generate over $31 million uh, of revenues related to uh, feasibility studies, design, uh, you know, the early stage of uh, OTEC uh, development. Um, so, you know, in 2015, when we turned our system on, that's when the big, you know, boom happened for OTEC and for our services there. Um, you know, the people heard about the, the promise of OTEC and they came to us to kind of analyze their location and see if it was possible. Uh, so we are still leading uh, this area in OTEC and, you know, people are coming to us probably, you know, every few weeks to to ask about OTEC and how we can how we can maybe help. Uh, and this is a large international market. Um, you know, the US actually doesn't have much um, much of the resource needed for OTEC. You need warm surface waters. Uh, and a lot of the a lot of the mainland United States doesn't have access to that. Um, so we're actually, you know, OTEC is a good technology um, for you know those countries around the equator. So we really market to those. Uh, we attend conferences, um, make sure that, you know, like I said, our, our customers are, are uh, knowledgeable about what we do. We were able to, you know, inform them. Uh, and then finally, I'll go through this one real quick is our research and development uh, subsea technology group. This just gives you an idea of the type of work that we do in that group. But again, this isn't, this isn't a very uh, internationally uh, this isn't an international um, commercial product or anything that we that we sell. Um, we have done some, you know, research and development type projects internationally, but uh, it's it's very limited. Um, but we were involved in undersea vehicles, uh, power communications and sensors, subsea, um, and then oceanographic software and towed arrays, which are you know cables that are towed behind a ship. Uh, again. We're, we're involved in anything subsea cable related. That's why we set, set ourselves apart there. Uh, and then, yeah, that's, that's, that's all I have here. Um, but if you guys have any questions for me, um, I'm definitely interested to hear uh, what you guys have to ask. Uh, and yeah, please get in Great. touch. Thank you very much, Herman. And th thank you to all of our speakers. These were excellent presentations on exporting of services. And with that, I'm going to move into the Q&A period. Uh, we have several questions. I'll go through them uh, as I can one by one. Some of them will overlap. Some of them are specific to one of the speakers and some of them I think are asking for general opinions from all three of the speakers. So. Uh, let's start with a question for Alicia. I'm working on franchising a restaurant concept. The operations would be wholly in, uh, in another country, though the franchise fees would be sent to the U.S. parent. Would that fit the definition of an export of services? Sounds like it probably would without having probably more specifics, I think that's gonna fall into the categories related to um, intellectual property royalties. And in fact, franchising fees, as I recall, is specifically listed according, and in, in this is where BEA gets in, in as they consider uh, 
franchise or fees for exporting in our statistics. So hopefully that answers the question. Sure. One more question for you, Alicia. Uh, what FTAs are in development beyond the ones that you highlighted? Um, maybe we, we've heard about TPP and others, but do you know of anything? I'm sorry, I missed the first part of that question. I was having a little bit of a breakup. Sure. What FTAs are in development beyond the ones that are in your list? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the Senate just confirmed the United States trade representative uh, a couple of days ago, and I have not seen um, any indication yet as to which FTAs she will pursue. Um, there were a couple of FTAs under discussion under the last administration, but it's not yet clear if those will be continued with the new administration. Can you say which countries those are? Do you recall? Previously, it was Kenya, UK, and European Union, the 27 countries of the European Union. Great. Thank you. And then um, related to the FTA, there's a question. Um, assuming the FTAs, uh, let's just pick chorus with Korea, it harmonizes the um, the uh, terms that are used to say what is a service, what is not a service, uh, right? So what about countries where we do not have an FTA? Is it your experience that a service in the United States is a service in Japan, for example? Um, do, do the countries generally consider services to be the same thing or are there some differences? So this is an interesting question. Um, we actually rely on the WTO, General Agreement on Trade and Services. And there's, I haven't looked at it lately, but over a hundred plus countries that fall, have subscribed to the definition of services uh, in that um, agreement. So that tends to help us go from one country to the other. But I laugh a little bit because, and I've heard this as a conversation, but I've never gone and actually validated it for myself. But Finland, I heard a couple of years ago, reclassified smartphones as a service, as opposed to a product, because so much of the what you do on a smartphone is in fact more in the apps and the services related. So it's interesting. Um, it's also, you know, Boeing, somebody from Boeing once came to me and they said they define themselves as a services company. They are a huge manufacturer. They make airplanes. I think they're one of our biggest in the world. And yet, because so much of what they do involves all of the data they collect from the airplanes as they travel around the world, they're also considering how much of them, how much of their business model is really based on the services. So, the definitions are getting very blurry lately. Great. Okay, thank you. The next question is uh, for Robert Zhang, but I think that uh, Herman, you could also chime in. Uh, what are some of the challenges you faced when developing your export model? Not everything goes perfectly. I can tell you, um, one example we had probably around, I would say 15, 20 years ago, we found that Vietnam would be um, a country um, with a lot of promises, promising markets for us. And there's a lot of people talking about that uh, back in those time, uh, the days. So we were kind of wondering if we should go find a bit of resources um, to tap into our networking, um, and assets to see whether we can get into that market. Uh, but in the end, we actually send one principal, the partners to go, to do a first hand, uh, really kind of scouting trips to, uh, to, that, to that country by talking to um, a few people from different, different um, sectors. And we made an assessment um, in terms of the confirmation of the international business practice of the mentality of the local clients, potential clients, we concluded that was not a good timing to go into Vietnam. Hence, we kind of 
uh, stopped their efforts towards that market until almost 10 years later. Now I can tell you right now it's the second largest market for us um, in the Asia Pacific region. So the point I want to make is really knowing the macro level uh, of the development uh, of the locale, uh, particularly for those emerging uh, developing countries. Uh, if it's a developed country, um, I think it's, it's less so in that regard. It's then it more comes down to matter of how you can find the right partners. So you need to look at it from first from the macro level, then down to the micro level to assess the market, the suitabilities for, for us, for you to get into. So we made some mistakes in that regard by, uh, I would say kind of not reading that timing correctly and, and get into it. And then I can give you another example, let's say. We decided to go into China uh, probably, we actually entered China in 1978. You know that the significance of that is that was before U.S. established diplomat diplomatic relationships with China. That was 1979. Uh, but that was really under uh, the invitation of a, of a potential client from Hong Kong or Whitdale. So then back in, then we uh, fast forward to 80s and even early 90s, we thought it's about the time. So we, we start to make a lot of trips uh, to there. And they find out actually still the market is not that ready yet, even though the, the country started to open uh, more and more to the outside world. So you have to really read that um, uh, correctly so that you can really catch the wave, uh, just like really uh, do the surfing in Hawaii. So, so that would be some mistakes we made and then we learned from that. And Great. China now is the biggest market for us in that region. Great. Thank you. Herman, do you have any comment? I would, yeah, I would say the, the biggest issue that we faced um, was really you know explaining what we bring you know especially as a service our rates are a lot higher than what uh you know they might expect you know in a underdeveloped or developing country uh where you know we've had projects before and we've given them our proposals for you know our our services and they get a little bit of sticker shock um because they're not used to like i said employee rates being what they are in the United States, especially for you know engineering services. Um, so the biggest challenge that we faced was you know really informing our clients and saying, laying out specifically what we bring, you know why you know if they went with a local engineering company, what the problems might be. You know someone without the experience in you know these pipelines. They could damage that pipe, as I mentioned, and you know that's that's the risk that they're going to have to take on. Uh, and similarly with the with the cable software and cable services, um, you know the services that we actually provide on the vessel. Uh, it's important for us to say, you know, for us to explain, if you don't have a good grasp of this software, you know, it's those projects are even larger. You know, installing a cable between two continents, you know, you could damage that piece of uh, infrastructure. Um, so that's, that's what we need to explain to them. And we've had troubles before, um, but it's, it's more just the way to resolve it is just keep talking with them and make sure you're being very clear about, you know, what service you provide versus, you know, what they would be, what they could expect, you know, if they went with someone else or just didn't use our services entirely. Okay. Let's, uh, stay with Herman and then, uh, maybe Robert can follow on after that. Uh, when you're marketing your services internationally, um, are you using uh, trade shows? Um, and how do you find local partners? Uh, Robert's referred to local partners several times. And I'm curious, uh, uh, when you're selling goods and services, a local partner could be a sales agent or a distributor or something like that. But when you're selling services, what is the difference there? And how do you define a local partner? What do they do in these markets for you? Yeah, sure. So I'd say for your question about, you know, what we do to market our products, we do go to, you know, technical conferences. That's the big thing for us. Um, you know, going to these conferences where for the cable industry, you know, they have their own conferences and basically all the major players are there and we 
what we really like to do is either put out a, a technical paper or present. Um, and that's kind of the best way to get eyes on, on, you know, your service. Uh, and that's where you can, you know, describe what you bring uh, in the best way, I think. Um, you know, being able to, to, you know, lay out all the technical details and have, have the technical people from those companies also be, be at the conference and be able to then take that back to their, you know, to their team and, you know, describe what we bring and why it's important. Um, regarding, you know, local partners, we did have sales reps in a few countries for our uh, cable software, as you mentioned, Rob, that that's kind of the way to do it for, for a, a product. Um, but, you know, finding a local partner for services is, uh, is a little challenging, but what we have done uh, as an example, I'll tell you, you know, the, in the, in the pipeline industry, we partner with the pipe manufacturers. So that's really important because they get, you know, they get the properties of the pipe, they understand the challenges involved. And then a lot of uh, like engineering firms or uh, project owners will actually go to those, you know, pipe uh, suppliers, you know, when they're, when they're starting a project and they'll ask, you know, for a pricing, pricing of a pipe or something. And then they're able to then, you know, say, well, we know of Makai Ocean Engineering who has the capabilities to design this. Um, and then they can kind of help, help that process of informing the client or uh, project owner of, um, you know, what we bring and the importance of having someone with our experience on the team. Uh, even if we aren't the prime engineer, um, a lot of the times we aren't. We are a sub engineer uh, for just the offshore pipeline project or part of the project. And then, you know, the onshore infrastructure is handled by the larger uh, prime engineering firm. Uh, so that's another uh, another local partner that we go with. You know, we, we partner with those large primes that will likely get approached with these projects by the project owners. Um, and they'll, you know, they'll involve us when it's needed as well. Okay, so a pretty typical EPC model of uh, working in the supply chain there and finding maybe bigger players that you can partner with and piggyback with. Okay, that's great. Uh, exactly. Robert, do you, do you have any comment there? Yeah, just want to add, uh, um, usually particularly for uh, a new market, uh, we participate in, in some kind of trade missions by the uh, Department of Commerce. We also use um, the commercial section of our um, our embassies in, in those countries, and we you can actually tell them uh, on in that uh, in that case uh, who you want to meet, uh, or you can even find out who are the major players in terms. For our case, we really look at the major developers in the, in a certain country, a particular locale, and then you can ask them to set up meetings. So that that's one way to help us to get into the market. Um, you use the government's uh, potential um, to be exposed to some uh, potential partners. Once you pass that stage, you don't um, you don't need that type of service much um, versus in, in the early stage. And then you can really build up relationships and gain more knowledge of, of it. And then the other type uh, of local partners, in our case, I would say it's more like, because um, we're the architecture design firm, and then you will see the competitions from any market. Look at who the major ones over there. When they come across a high profile project, they might be required to team up with a international uh, design consultants to help them create that, um, the concepts of the project, which is really the creativity comes into play. Uh, that's what we are known for. Uh, so you can tap up with them and then um, they can actually provide a lot of local knowledge in terms of some intelligence about the potential uh, clients, which you may, you may find it very difficult to find that kind of information, uh, particularly in those uh, developing countries. Um, and then some other collaborators, uh, this is some agencies. We do not use um, uh, the sales agent per se, but I think it's really built up a lot of networks 
uh, in the markets in the, in the hope that you can also uh, reciprocate some business to them as well, and also help them to do their job in a more efficient, in a better way. So it's, it's a mutual beneficial relationship and that also can help us to sustain. Great, thank you. The next question is for Alicia specifically, uh, would providing insurance services for foreign investment projects in the U.S. be considered an export? Uh, and if so, would you recommend the insurance company participate in Select USA in order to make contacts with foreign investors? I don't know that it's an export because the investment is everything takes place in the United States. So even though you are covering uh, a foreign investment, but the fact that it's in the United States, I think that would probably, and I, I'm not the BEA expert on what's in, what's out. Um, I think that would ex not be an export. That would just be a service. That said, Select USA and their annual conference is an excellent way to go and to meet people. Um, we bring in uh, investors from lots of different countries to those conversations. Usually we also have our uh, representatives from every, almost every state at those meetings. So it's a good way to make connections, even not necessarily with the investor, but for other people who will be advising the investor along the way and working with the investor. So I definitely recommend, if you're interested in working on those kinds of projects, to go ahead and meet with, uh, participate in Select USA. Okay, great. Any Further questions? It sounds to me like hearing from you all that one of the, the key aspects is being customer centric. Um, I think that that's sort of common sense, but maybe a lot of companies don't follow that rule and that we should really be common. Uh, I mean, uh, customer centric. I liked that um, Herman and uh, Robert were both talking about the Aloha spirit and marketing Hawaii in general when uh, building that into their marketing plans and their, their product portfolio, get the Hawaii-ness out there. Uh, I think that that's fantastic and our companies need to do uh, much more of that. So uh, since there are no more questions, I'd like to uh, wrap this up and uh, say thank you very much to Alicia Taylor from the Department of Commerce Robert Jang from WATG Architecture and Herman Kugler from Mackay Ocean Engineering. We greatly appreciate your time this morning and passing on your expertise of exporting of services to our audience. Again, my name is Rob Hack. I'm from the Hawaii Pacific Export Council. And please look for a copy of this uh, webinar to be posted to our YouTube archive in about a week. And so thank you again, everybody. Mahalo. Have a nice rest of your day. Thank you.